Calcifying odontogenic cyst was first described by Corlin et al. in the year 1962. Because of his contribution, it was termed as Corlin cyst. But again, irrespective of the name, it has no relationship whatsoever with the syndrome Corlin Gold's syndrome. Now, calcifying odontogenic cyst can be defined as a rare, a well circumscribed, solid or cystic lesion which is derived from the odontogenic epithelium. Now, this entity resembles the follicular variant of ameloblastoma. Now again, the characteristic feature is the presence of the ghost cells as well as the spherical calcifications resembling dentine. Now, Gorlin, when he first described this entity, noticed the presence of ghost cells as well as the spherical calcifications. He also appreciated its resemblance to the cutaneous lesion pylomatrix soma, which also had the presence of ghost cell. This entity was also called as calcifying epithelium of Melherbe, hence favoring its naming also. Now, this particular entity was surrounded by lots of controversies, especially those concerning its pathogenesis as well as its histopathological variations. Now, the four factors were considered. First one was the existence of two variants of this lesion, that is a cystic variant and a solid or a neoplastic variant. The second one was that it had a variable clinical as well as histopathological features. That is, though it was considered as a cyst, it greatly resembled a dendinogenic ghost cell tumor or an odontogenic ghost cell carcinoma. Now, it is also seen to be associated with other odontogenic tumors, most commonly odentoma, but other tumors like AOT or ameloblastoma were also seen to occur with this lesion. Classification, if you want to talk about the classification, the first one was described by Pectorius in their 1981 who divided it into a cystic lesion and a neoplastic lesion. Now the cystic lesions were further divided into simple unicystic and odentoma producing type and then lastly the ameloblastomatous producing type. The neoplasm was the dendinogenic ghost cell tumor. Now, Toida et al. in their 1998 divided it again into a cystic, a neoplasm and a combined lesion. So, the cystic lesion was the calcifying ghost cell odontogenic cyst. The neoplasm had the benign calcifying ghost cell odontogenic tumor. Then, there was a cystic variant of the same lesion. Then, a solid variant. And then finally, a malignant variant. Now, the combined lesion was when any of this category was seen in association with an odontogenic lesion like an odentoma, ameloblastoma or any other odontogenic tumor. Next, Pectorius again in the year 2016 suggested through communication a classification for ghost cell lesions. So, group 1 comprised of a simple cyst, that is the calcifying odontogenic cyst. Group 2 was a cyst which is associated with an odontogenic hamartoma or a benign neoplasm, like calcifying cystic odontogenic tumor, with the combinations of those occurring with an odontoma, those associated with an adenomatoid odontogenic tumor, ameloblastoma, ameloblastic fibroma or fibroodentoma odentoameloblastoma and finally with an odontogenic mixofibroma. Now the group 3 comprised of those solid benign odontogenic neoplasms which had similar cell morphology as that of a COC with dentine formation that is a dentinogenic ghost cell tumor. And type 4 was a malignant neoplasm which resembled endogenic ghost cell tumor which is the ghost cell odontogenic carcinoma. Now what happens or what is the place of this particular cyst in WHO classification? 
So in the year 1992, it was classified as a cyst that is COC. In the year 2005, it was put as a tumor that is the calcifying cystic odontogenic tumor, which is a mixed lesion. Now, in the year 2017, WHO again reclassified as, as a cyst. Why so many changes? Why this was happening? It's so confusing. Now, there were two concepts which played an important role in these decisions. So, the first one is the monolistic concept and the second one is the dualistic concept. So, from long time there is controversy whether it is a cyst or a tumor. So, in the monolistic concept, they considered it to be a tumor which shows secondary cystic changes. So, this supported its classification as a tumor in the year 2005. Whereas, in the year 2017, authors started accepting the dualistic concept wherein two entities are present which is as a cyst that is COC or a tumor which is put as a dendinogenic go cell tumor. So, this supported the reclassification as a cyst in the year 2017. Moving on to the histogenesis, so the exact source of epithelium is not understood but when you differentiate it into two groups that is the central or the intraosseous COC and the peripheral or the extraosseous COC, we can talk about the different possible sources. So for central it can be from the reduced enamel epithelium or the remnants of the dental lamina. Whereas for the peripheral or the extraosseous variant, it can be from the basal cells of the oral epithelium. Now, uh, talking about the clinical aspects of this lesion. So, when we uh, see the age group, it has more of a wide age group uh, uh, affecting anyone between the age of 1 to 82 years and being more common in the second decade. Now, sex and racial predilections are not there and the most common site is the anterior jaw with the mandibular lesions often crossing the peripheral uh, midline. Whereas, in peripheral lesions, both the maxillary as well as the mandibular gingiva and alveolar mucosa anterior to the first molar are commonly affected. Now, 50% of the cases, the most common complaint is swelling. And pain again is a rare occurrence for this group of patients. Central lesions will reveal a hard bony expansion which can be fairly extensive. Again, in few cases, lingual expansion or perforation of the cortical plate extending into the soft tissue resembling a peripheral lesion is seen. Peripheral lesions again can be pink to red in color they will be circumscribed and will reveal an elevated mass which can measure up to 4 cm in its diameter. Again, it has a tendency to wriggle. So, in the first picture, you can see a central or an intraosseous lesion which, which has expanded to a large size resembling a very aggressive lesion. Whereas, in case of a peripheral lesion, it's going to look like some kind of a gingival growth seen in the anterior gingival region. So, next we are moving on to the radiographic features of COC. So, this lesion will present as a well-defined radiolucent lesion, which will show dispersed radio-opaque flex of varying density depending upon the rate of calcification. Again, one-fourth of the cases show divergence or resorption of the root of the two that are involved. Again, this lesion can be either a unilocular or a multilocular radiolucency. So, in this picture, you can see a well-defined radiolucent lesion with radiopaque flex dispersed within. In this OPG, if you look closely, you can see a large expansive lesion which is showing some degree of radiopaque material within it. Now, let's talk about the histopathological or the microscopic aspects of COC. Now, the lining epithelium of COC will have a characteristic feature of that of an odontogenic epithelium. 
Now the thickness is kind of non-uniform, having 6 to 8 layer thickness in one area and being very thin in the other. Now the basal layer is fairly prominent, being made up of columnar or cuboidal cells with a hyperchromatic prominent palisadine nucleus, polarized away from basement membrane resembling that of an ameloblast. Now the characteristic feature of this thing is going to be the presence of budding or mural nodulations. So now what are these budding or mural nodulations? So when the epithelium is going to proliferate towards the lumen, it's a mural nodule. When it happens towards connective tissue, it is budding. Now melanin deposition can also be evident in the lining epithelium. Now ghost cells are one of the two characteristic features that you see in COC. Now these cells will be eosinophilic, ovoid or round structures or cell-like things that are seen dispersed among the superficial layers. So now these cells surrounding the ghost cells will show evidence of intercellular edema and will be separated. Now these ghost cells may be arranged singly dispersed within the epithelial lining. Like in this picture that I've drawn, so you can see that there are some loosely arranged cells in between these, these ghost cells are dispersed. Or they may be seen in groups. Now when they are present in groups, the epithelium seen around them will be convoluted, which gives rather really convoluted appearance of the lining epithelium. Now I've been talking about ghost cells from, since the first slide. So what all are these ghost cells? What are these cells? How are they formed? What is its significance here? Why should we learn about these? So ghost cells are actually enlarged ovoid cells. So they may be elongated or ellipsoid epithelial cells. They have an eosinophilic structure. Now when you see it microscopically, they have a distinct cellular outline or blood. They may have a new, uh, no nucleus or a pyknotic nucleus. So the hazy appearance of the cytoplasm gave it the name the ghost cell. Now, now we know how it looks like. So how are they formed? So what forms this particular thing? So there are four theories. So it can be because of abnormal keratin production because cytokeratin was found to be positive in these cells. Now it is an, derived from an odontogenic epithelium. So this may be produced by an odent as a product of odontogenic cell secretion. It can be some secretion by the odontogenic cells. Now thirdly, these epithelial cells may have undergone some kind of an coagulative necrosis. That is why the outline is intact and the full inside looks hazy. Lastly, it can be because of dystrophic calcification that is taking place. That is, the cells may begin to undergo calcification. So, in some cases, what can happen is that the ghost cells that are seen in the lining epithelium, they may enter into the connective tissue. So, the immune cells that are present in the connective tissue do not recognize these ghost cells that have suddenly entered into their space. So, they will elicit an attack mode from multinucleated giant cells which start to engulf these ghost cells forming a foreign body reaction. So this may also be evident in few cases. Now what is going to be the second characteristic feature that I talked about? So now the next important feature that is diagnostic or characteristic is the presence of the dentinoid or the dentine like calcifications that you see. So it may be seen within the epithelium or will be seen close to the epithelial connective tissue interface. Now this is always seen in association with the ghost cell. So they said that this may actually be produced by the calcification of the ghost cells also. So now in this microscopic feature you can clearly visualize the convoluted epithelium with the prominent basal ameloblastoma like layer and the characteristic ghost cells that is dispersed between. Now in this next picture you can see the dentinoid like material and the surrounding area such as spherical calcifications in associated. So next moving on to the electron microscopic feature or the ultrastructural feature of COC. 
Now, ultra-structurally, what was found was that these ghost cells were actually the degenerated odontogenic epithelial cells. Now again, this perical dentine-like calcifications were found to be dystrophic calcification that is actually taking place in these ghost cells. So, this dystrophic calcifications showed an amorphous core which is surrounded by concentric calcified rings. So next, uh, we'll talk about the immunohistochemical markers that are traditionally used in case of COC. So these are your cytokeratin 7, 8, 14 and 19, KI67, beta catenin then amylogenesis related proteins because calcified material is there. This may also help in identification. Then the matrix metalloproteinases, the hard alpha keratin, uh, podoplanin and then the apoptotic marker which is BCL2. So, so moving on to the treatment aspects. So uh, conventionally COC is treated by surgical enucleation. So this treatment modality has to be changed when there is an associated odontogenic tumor in which case a wider excision is preferred. So now again conservative removal is preferred when there is a complex odonto associated. But again recurrence is very rare even when the lesion has reached a very large size. So recurrence is not a common phenomenon. So when excision or enucleation is done, it's more than enough. Now moving on to the final topic, which is the malignant transformation. Now COC undergoes extremely rare malignant transformation. So even if it is considered to be a tumor, the transformation to your ghost cell odontogenic carcinoma is very rarely reported. I hope you like this video. Please press the like button and subscribe to our channel and do give your feedback in the form of comments. Thank you and have a nice day.